Hi, this is Gina Piscatelli with the second or third lecture um, on the immune system. And in this lecture, the topic will be cell mediated immunity. Uh, it's still a process of adaptive immunity versus resistance mechanisms. And on this first slide, what we have or what you're looking at is uh, a T cell or a T lymphocyte that is being presented with an antigen that's blue. I don't want to cover it up with my drawing. And the presentation is happening by probably a dendritic cell. It could be a macrophage, I can't tell. Um, and the T cell recognizes it with its receptor. And um, there's an amino acid that you might remember called cysteine. And this cartoon is kind of making fun of the fact that this amino acid cysteine reminded somebody of the Sistine Chapel in which Michelangelo painted this picture that you see here. And we have God touching, I don't know, is that Adam? Is that, I don't know who it is, I'm sorry. Uh, sorry for the Christian sort of emphasis here, but it's kind of a guess that this looks, this picture looks a little bit like that. And here we have presentation of an antigen to a T lymphocyte. And there's a sequence of amino acids um, on this T cell receptor that helps recognize the antigen. It's called cysteine. But anyway, we'll let that go. And let's just talk about cell mediated immunity and what its functions are. Cell mediated immunity acts through T lymphocytes and some of those can directly kill damaged host cells. So your own body cells. The cells that are destroyed would be cancer cells or cells infected with a virus or a bacteria, as well as foreign cells that are grafted or transplanted into your body. But one of the most powerful functions of cell mediated immunity is the fact that it enhances many other mechanisms defense mechanisms as well as humoral immunity and uh, T lymphocyte function. And so in this way, cell mediated immune immunity um, indirectly can cause destruction of cells that are infected or whatever, or bacterial cells even, by releasing certain chemicals that enhance inflammation and activate other leukocytes. So we're going to get to these functions a little bit later. First, let's just talk about who's involved. So T lymphocytes are the main effectors in cell mediated immunity. And there's two types of T lymphocytes. One type is called a cytotoxic T cell. The other type is called a helper T cell. But don't let this name helper fool you. They're very powerful cells. So the cytotoxic T cells, uh, we also sometimes call CD8 positive cells. And that's because this cytotoxic T cell has a protein on its surface that's called a CD8 cell or CD8 protein, excuse me. CD, you might remember, stands for clusters of differentiation. So somebody named this protein that formed or developed or differentiated the eighth one, so CD8. Helper T cells, by contrast, are CD4 um, positive cells. So they have a CD4 protein on their surface. Of course, both types of T lymphocytes have receptors that will recognize an antigen. So they both have T cell receptors. And they will recognize an antigen much like an antibody would. OK, let's look at how these cells um, develop the T lymphocytes from. So this is the life cycle of T lymphocytes. And they originate from hematopoietic stem cells in the red bone marrow. So in the red bone marrow. And you know that would be the head of the femur versus the shaft, right? in an adult anyway. Okay, then the T lymphocyte 
migrates out of the bone marrow to travel in blood vessels to the thymus. And remember, the thymus gland was really large when we were dissecting our cats. Um, it does decrease in humans with age, uh, but it starts out pretty big during development. To facilitate the maturation of uh, lots of different types of T lymphocytes. So maturation of T lymphocytes occurs in the thymus, and that's why they're named T cells. And they leave the thymus after they're mature uh, in blood vessels to go to secondary lymphatic organs like lymph nodes. Now these T lymphocytes, even though they're mature, we still call them naive because they haven't actually encountered antigens yet or at least not systemically have they. They, get, they went through an education process in the thymus, but they haven't responded to an infection yet. So then these um, naive T lymphocytes that are present in secondary organs, like lymphatic organs, like lymph nodes, encounter antigens. And once they encounter antigens, they do proliferate and many more T lymphocytes are formed, including memory T cells. And all the T cells that are formed, memory or otherwise, can circulate between the blood, the lymph or lymphatic fluid, and secondary lymphatic organs to protect us. Let's talk a little bit about how T lymphocytes mature. It's a process of selection, much like we saw with um, B lymphocytes. But in this case, we're not talking about antibodies. We're talking about T, T cell receptors, because that's what recognizes specific antigens. So to survive, a T lymphocyte has to have receptors that are all identical. So it doesn't just have one receptor on the surface. It's going to have many and they all have to be identical. In addition, a T lymphocyte receptor and the associated uh, CD protein have to be able to recognize and bind to what are known as MHC molecules on our cells, our host cells, our body cells. And I'll tell you what those are in just a second. MHC molecules. The last thing is that a T cell receptor should only recognize and bind to foreign antigens displayed on the host's MHC molecules, not to self antigens. Okay, let's talk a little bit about these molecules called MHC molecules. MHC stands for major histocompatibility complex and um, there's a picture of them down there on the bottom you don't have to be able to recognize them but they are glycoproteins so proteins that are glycosylated there's a little carbohydrate on them and they're on every single body cell in an individual but there are two types there's class 1 and class 2 so there are some cells that only have class 2 but we still have an MHC molecule on every single cell in our bodies. And they are unique for each of us. So each individual has a certain sequence of amino acids in the MHC molecule that's different from someone else's. And they are not immunogenic, meaning they don't elicit an immune response by themselves because they should not be Im immunogenic to our body cells, including any immune cells, but they could be strongly, strongly immunogenic to other individuals. So other individuals might see these MHCs as foreign antigens. We do not see our own that way. So the two types of MHCs are called class one and class two, but we usually abbreviate them MHC1 and MHC2. MHC1 is located on every cell in your body except erythrocytes. Red blood cells, if you remember, they don't really have a nucleus. They don't process antigens. They don't make um, proteins. And so they're not going to make MHC. 
these MHC molecules display antigens that have been made inside of the cell. We would call those endogenous antigens. So sometimes those antigens are just from normal metabolism, like they're just self antigens. Other times they're from cells that have engulfed a particle and then somehow processed it and displayed uh, the foreign particle. Um, but anyway, so these are on all of your cells, MHC1s. MHC2s are located only in the membranes of very specific cells called antigen presenting cells. And these are specialized cells found in the thymus that help educate T cells, found in the membranes of macrophages, B lymphocytes, and dendritic cells in the skin. Now these almost always display exogenous antigens that have been engulfed may be processed slightly but very very little and then uh, put on the cell surface. So I'll show you some pictures of how these MHCs work um, but let's first look at what antigen presenting cells are so that it makes a little bit of sense to you. So an antigen presenting cell as I mentioned would be a dendritic cell in the skin, a macrophage, a B lymphocyte or reticulocyte. And they are absolutely required for T cells to actually recognize an antigen. So T cells require antigens to be presented to them. Not only do they have to learn about MHCs, but they have to be treated specially and have these antigens presented to them. So an antigen presenting cell will engulf an antigen and then present fragments on its surface so that T cells will recognize and bind. So the purple cell on the left is probably supposed to represent a dendritic cell, but it's an APC. It's a cell of your body, one of these four, that has engulfed something, processed it, to some extent and then put it out on its surface but it puts it on an MHC molecule. So you'll notice that um, the antigen is red and I know it's really hard to see in this picture and the MHC molecule is in the membrane of the purple cell and the MHC is attached to the antigen. This is the only way a T cell will recognize a foreign antigen is, it, is if it's sitting complexed with this MHC. And so we have the blue T cell that has a receptor for that specific antigen that's recognizing it because it's being presented on an antigen presenting cells MHC. So this is the process of how antigens are processed um, and presented. So this would be the big huge purple cell. Uh, I'm going to say it looks like a macrophage, but it has engulfed some sort of antigen. In this case, it's a bacterial cell. Looks like a bacteria, rod shaped, which then fuses with a lysosome and gets broken down into pieces. Now those pieces, some of them are just going to be voided by exocytosis. But some of them are going to be processed and displayed on the surface of the macrophage attached to an MHC glycoprotein. So first, for an antigen presenting cell to even do this, it has to ingest something, then digest it, and then it can finally present it. a lot of work for the T um, to accommodate these T cells. Okay, so uh, let's talk a little bit about which type of T lymphocytes require which type of MHC. We call this MHC restriction. So we already know there's two types of lymphocytes, 
cytotoxic T cells and helper T cells. Cytotoxic T cells, even though they sound so deadly, recognize antigens that are on MHC1, MHC1. But MHC1 is found on all your body cells. Okay, so cytotoxic T cells can actually kill just about any type of cell. Helper T cells, in contrast, they have to recognize antigens on MHC2. And these are only found on antigen presenting cells. So I, I would say that the helper T cell has a nicer sounding name, like it's not going to kill very much, right? But it has such a strong effect that it's, it's beneficial that it's restricted to responding to infected APCs only, not all types of cells in your body. So when an antigen presenting cell engulfs an antigen, it has to display it on the MHC2, um, and then a helper's T cell will recognize it. And I'd like to mention that the cytotoxic T cells, although they can kill any body cell, then they're done. They kill that one cell and they're done. But helper T cells have such a long lasting effect that they're activated and they recognize this antigen on a subset of your body cells, only APCs, and then they, they produce a widespread effect. So it's kind of good that MHC2s are limited to just one kind of cell to avoid a, a full mounted immune response when only a couple of your cells are infected or something. So anyway, it's all about statistics and likelihood of encountering um, an antigen on an antigen presenting cell. Okay, let's look at how T lymphocytes fight pathogens. Well, cytotoxic T cells, as I already implied, can directly destroy one of our infected cells by um, using perforins and granzymes, just like natural killer cells. If you remember, natural killer cells in the resistance mechanisms could uh, release perforins and granzymes and, and kill a cell. But cytotoxic T cells will only destroy cells that display a foreign antigen on MHC1. Helper T cells do a lot more. They don't actually kill, but when they recognize um, an antigen displayed again on a, an MHC2, they release cytokines. They are activated. And those cytokines or chemicals induce clonal expansion, not only of T cells, but also of B cells that are specific for that exact antigen. And of course, once you have clonal expansion of B cells, you've made a lot of plasma cells that produce antibodies. I'm just going to draw a Y. So you're making tens of thousands of antibodies. In addition, these uh, helper T cell cytokines enhance inflammation by activating complement, by recruiting other leukocytes. And so we're going to look at what happens when uh, a, a cell-mediated immune response occurs. So what are the steps that the cell-mediated immune system takes when you're first exposed? So we call this a primary response. The first thing is that the antigen has to be recognized. Then whichever type of T lymphocyte recognizes the antigen, it's activated. That's as far as it goes if you're talking about um, cytotoxic T cells. They do their killing and they're done. But if it's a helper T cell that has 
recognized an antigen. The activation will cause memory formation, not only an attack. Okay, so let's look at what happens specifically. So first we have antigen recognition. And if there's a T helper cell, we're going to go with the most extreme case here, a T helper cell, we consider it naive because it's never encountered one before. And it recognizes um, a T, oh, sorry, the, sorry, I was getting lost. Um, this is a CD4 cell that I'm talking about. And this is the helper T cell that has a receptor that recognizes the foreign antigen, which is red, displayed on an MHC2. And so in this picture, I'm talking about a helper T cell recognizing this purple MHC2. In addition, the CD4 protein binds to that MHC2, and we get this co-stimulation ha happening. This binding event activates the helper T cell, which is over here, the helper T cell. So it's activated, and it typically will release this binding event. And now what happens? Well, first of all, the T cell enlarges, and it undergoes cell division. So you get, and then those daughter cells undergo division, and then more and more and more. So you get this huge number of T cells that recognize exactly the same antigen. We call this clonal expansion. Some of the clones will differentiate into memory T cells. Others will just become more helper T cells. We'll also get some cytotoxic T cells because once the helper T cell becomes activated, it has already released a whole bunch of cytokines even before clonal expansion happens. And the cytokines help form some of these cytotoxic T cells from the clone. The cytokines also cause B cells specific for the same antigen to increase in number. And other cytokines recruit lots of other leukocytes. So these helper T cells do a lot. The attack process, <clears throat> because you really want them to do something, would be that the cytotoxic T cells will um, destroy an infected cell with perforins and granzymes. So this is the cytotoxic T cell on the left, and this is the antigen-presenting cell. It still has to have the antigen presented to it. And it'll be on MHC1. And when this binding event happens, then the T, cytotoxic T cell releases the perforins and the granzymes so that the cell dies. Another form of attack would be that <clears throat> all the helper T cells that formed by clonal expansion, they can seek out other <clears throat> antigen presenting cells. For example, a B lymphocyte that's displaying the same ant antigen. If this occurs, then clones of that B cell will also form. And you know that when B cell clones form, some of the clones will become plasma cells and just produce enormous amounts of antibodies, which then tag the same foreign antigens or foreign cells and mark them for destruction. The last form of attack would be that um, helper T cells recruit other cytokines to do their killing for them, I guess. So um, once the helper T cell has recognized a foreign antigen and it releases its cytokines, it um, some of those cytokines activate basophils, which release histamine, and you get vasodilation, and then lots more leukocytes, including lymphocytes, can leave the bloodstream and go out to wherever a site of infection is. 
Now, cytokines could also recruit neutrophils, which can do phagocytosis, macrophages, which can do cyto um, phagocytosis, eosinophils, which can only phagocytize antigen antibody complexes, but still, that's helpful, and natural killer cells, which you know can kill by perforins and granzymes. Okay, the last function of cell-mediated immunity is the memory aspect. And that's what the power is. Um, another aspect of the power of cell-mediated immunity is that memory T cells, like memory B cells, will live a long time, obviously longer than naive T lymphocytes, and they're more numerous than naive T cells. So you've got more cells recognizing the same antigen if it should ever come into the body again. They require fewer steps to be activated. I'm not exactly sure what that means, but I'm sure it has something to do with the binding events. And then the secondary response, that means the next time you're exposed to the same antigen, the memory T cells mount an attack so quickly that you shouldn't even notice illness or symptoms of illness. Even if you notice slight symptoms, they're usually due from more resistance mechanisms like fever inflammation. And so in this case, the person is immune because of the presence of these memory T cells. They do a lot, maybe more than antibodies do. Thank you very much. And that's all for this lecture.